a signature course that Knife Wonder and I have been teaching now for six years. Um, today we're doing a, a special version of the class that's looking at issues of black women, politics, and desire. The framing for the conversation, of course, is Beyonce's formation. Um, one quick public service announcement, a la Chris Rock. We are, in fact, selling Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> we have Thin Mints, Caramel Delights. They are $4 a box. Uh, many members of the class have already bought boxes of Girl Scout cookies for those of you who are visiting. Um, please feel free. Um, we have a student here who will be walking the crowd and selling Girl Scout cookies. So please support Girl Scout Troop here in Durham, North Carolina. <laughs> I'm going to start by introducing our panel, beginning with our moderator. Dr. Ebony Terman Marshall, an author, ordained minister, university professor, and public theologian. The Reverend Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman is a refreshing addition to our most pressing national discussions of faith, race, and gender. With a decidedly womanist point of view, here, she, hers stands out as one of the few female voices offering the moral perspective on issues facing the black community. A trailblazer in church and academy, her pioneering spirit has earned her many rare distinctions. She was the youngest woman to be named assistant minister at the historic Abyssinian Baptist Church. For those who don't know, that is the church of Adam Clayton Powell, senior and junior, and currently Reverend Calvin Butts. She is the only African-American theological ethicist on the faculty of Duke University's Divinity School, where she is the director of black church studies. She's the author toward a womanist ethic in, in, of incarnation, black bodies, the black church, and the council of Chalcedon, Ebony Marshall Terman. <laughs> Our second panelist is Dr. Yava Blay, a professor, producer, and publisher. As a researcher and ethnographer, she uses personal and social narratives to disrupt fundamental assumptions about cultures and identities. As a cultural worker and producer, she uses images to inform consciousness, incite dialogue, and inspire others into action and transformation. Her book, One Drop, Shifting the Lens on Race, explores the interconnected nuances of skin color politics and black racial identity, and challenges now perceptions of blackness as both an identity and a lived reality. She is currently the Dan Blue Endowed Chair in Political Science at North Carolina Central University. Dr. Blay is also the publisher and editor-in-chief of Black Print Press. Dr. Yalva Blay. The First Lady of Jamla, Rhapsody, is a North Carolina MC signed with the super producer Ninth Wonder for Jamla Records with the release of seven projects in just three years and a critically acclaimed debut album in August of 2012. She is slowly establishes herself as a major player in today's rap game. In just a short time, she has worked with some of the biggest legends and newcomers in the business, ranging from the likes of Kendrick Lamar, Erica Badu, Raekwon, Big Daddy Kane, Marsha Ambrosius, Mac Miller, and Big Crit, to name just a few. Uh, I understand there's a Terrence Martin, Terrace Martin project <laughs> coming down the road. Most recently, she was named one of the top female MCs to know both by Time Magazine and USA Today. She was also named one of the 20 greatest female rappers of all time by Double XL Magazine. She most recently released her 10-track EP, Beauty and the Beast, to much acclaim, and she is currently working on her sophomore album. In 2015, she was the only rap feature on Kendrick Lamar's critically acclaimed Grammy Award winning to pimp a butterfly on the song Complexion, representing and introducing Rhapsody. So of course, for this next intro, I'm not reading anything. So if you can see that photo rather closely, that is a five-year-old Joan Morgan on the left, 
uh, that is a five-year-old Mark Anthony Neal on the right. Standing in front of our tenement building in the Bronx, 1231 Fulton Avenue in the South Bronx, area co uh, zip code 10456. <laughs> um, just two black kids, an African-American kid with roots in the South, a Jamaican princess with roots in the Caribbean. Our mamas willed us to be best friends. Um, and of course now, 50 years later, almost 50 years later, um, we are just that. Um, she is the author, as most of the students know, When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost, My Life as a Hip Hop Feminist. She was a member of the groundbreaking first generation of writers for Vibe Magazine. She's also been an editor at Essence Magazine. She is currently a doctoral candidate, all but dissertation, at New York University. Um, so we will soon be calling her Dr. Joan Morgan. Um, and uh, she really is the inspiration for this evening. She was coming here and we thought let's build um, a program around her. So welcoming now uh, Joan Morgan. And now I will pass the program on to Dr. Ebony Marshall Turman. Beyonce and formation. But before we do that, I want to start with each of you. And I'm hoping that you will offer us um, some reflections on your own formation and how your identity as black women emanates through your artistry, your scholarship, and your practice. So talk to us about who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start? I'll go. <laughs> um, again, uh, I'm an MC, you know, who happens to be female. And uh, I think what I try to do through music is, you know, as far as being a woman, is take myself out of the box. You know, um, I talked to MC Light recently, and we talked about how things were a little bit different you know, when she was coming up with Queen Latifah and MC Light, and I was explaining to her, well, now it's different in 2016, where, you know, you're put in this box as a woman. Um, your skill level isn't, you know, supposed to be as high as a man, or, you know, uh, you're supposed to be pit against your, your other sisters because there's only supposed to be one at a time, you know, that, that has that spot. So I think with me and what I try to do with my formation is, you know, just take us out of that box and show that, you know, there's a space and a lane for us all and we all can be different. We all don't have to be this stereotypical idea of a female where you have to dress a certain way and you only have to um, rap about certain subject matters. Um, so, you know, that's my aim as far as formation, you know, and then self-love, um, too. Thank you. Um, I'm a black woman. I am a West African woman. I'm a black West African woman who grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm a black West African woman who grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, very dark skinned. Um, and in New Orleans, you know, colorism is at the forefront of our lived experiences. So I've always known that I'm dark skinned. And it's just kind of guided my work in terms of wanting to um, figure it out, A, and then also wanting to affirm other women, other girls who look like me. And so my work is very much about the aesthetics, but it's also about the politics. And so I like to get us to think critically about our position and our um, reflections in the context of white supremacy. So, you know, who are we and who are we able to be? And then ultimately, as you say, to come back to this space of self-love. So trying to create images and programs and projects that will ultimately encourage us to value ourselves. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so in addition to being Mark Anthony Neal's best friend, uh, which is a position of honor that I, that I hold and cherish, um, I am uh, a black uh, Caribbean-American woman 
who grew up in the South Bronx uh, in the 70s and was deeply, deeply uh, affected and shaped and nurtured and um, challenged by hip hop culture. And through a series of just really crazy circumstances, um, I left the South Bronx and went to pretty good schools and uh, majored in certain things. None of them had anything to do with hip hop and uh, didn't want to do any of them. And then found myself writing about what no, nothing, um, nothing in my academic career prepared me for writing about uh, hip hop. Actually, the South Bronx and the programs that Mark and I kind of came through, like Upper Bound, Prep for Prep, were really geared towards getting you out of the Bronx and getting as far away from it as possible. So the fact that I actually have a career reaching back to the Bronx and reaching back to that culture um, has meant a lot to me. Um, along the way, um, I discovered I was a feminist and um, I'm a deeply and proudly feminist black woman and I find a lot of joy in that. I find a lot of joy in uh, the, not just the complexity but the contradictions of being feminist and black and a woman and uh, growing up in America and being Jamaican. Um, you know, and I love actually playing with people's assumptions about how race and gender shape us. I love writing that helps to make black women free. Um, and that to me can be very strongly politicized in terms of Black Lives Matter. It can also just, I, I think our pleasure is deeply political. Um, and I reserve the right to really change shit up and fuck with your expectations all the time, which, you know, I, I, when Yaba picked me up this morning and my hair looked was shorter than hers and quick trip to Beauty World and 15 minutes later and now I'm, I'm blue and loving this. This is like a whole other thing. I'm a good I reserve friend. that right. She's I a good a friend. Good friend. Um, I'm also a pleasure ninja because Yaba and I actually do a lot of this pleasure politic work together. So that's also been a joy to work communally and collectively with other black women. So a lot has come up uh, in these introductions. <laughs> a lot has come up in these introductions from um, colorism to self-love to New Orleans, hip hop, joy, um, contradictions, reaching back. I think all of which we saw, elements of which we saw in the video in formation. So let's talk about it. What, what did Beyonce give us uh, as black women, as black people with this video? There have been tons of think pieces that have come forward um, with varied, um, varied reactions, right? From folks just being mad and hating. And she had a word for us about that in the video. Um, and others celebrating her and positioning her as perhaps a progenitor of a, a strand of the contemporary movement. But what, in your opinion, has she given us with formation? What's the line? You know you that bitch when you cause all this conversation? Exactly. So to me, um, I mean, I'm a Beyonce fan, and I very wisely took myself off Facebook and social media like February 1st. So I missed all of the um, high dramatics conflama around the video, which allowed me to really just enjoy it, not as a critic, mm -hmm. but as a piece of art. Mm -hmm. um, and so aesthetically, there are things in there that B did that I really love. Like, I love high fashion. There was a ton of it in that video. I love the nexus of, um, of uh, playing with kind of black spiritual African cultures um, and religious uh, practices with, uh, with this kind of like secular and put the mixture of the secular and the profane. Mm -hmm. um, I love that she was unapologetically herself and embraced her own contradiction and just told people they had to kind of deal with it. Um, but I think the most interesting thing for me as Beyonce is not necessary, not necessarily how she she would theorize her own political identity or her feminist identity. Right. I, what is fascinating to me 
um, as someone who's a cultural critic and a theorist, is to watch the reactions to her. Um, some of which, many of which um, are framed as analysis, but actually are deeply emotional um, and kind of non-critical, um, come from non-critical spaces. Do, when I say non-critical, I don't necessarily mean that as a judgment. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that what she challenges us to do is to see how our emotional selves feed um, even a kind of scholarly analysis that we have that really is not about like scholarship or really about, sometimes what Beyonce triggers is that hurt my feelings and I'm not really over that hurt, how that hurt my feelings like 10 years ago, 15 years ago in high school, and something about you brings that right to the surface. So for me, she's this amazing, um, almost kind of like Rorschach's test, because no two people see the same thing when they look at Beyonce, um, but she evokes really powerful emotions for people. And I think the conversation around that tells us a lot more about us than it does actually about Beyonce. Mm -hmm. And for me, I am also a Beyonce fan, um, very much so, I love Dee. But I think I came from a different place when the video dropped and um, there's a group of us on a thread, a, a WhatsApp thread that we communicate with and I remember it was a Saturday afternoon and the video dropped and my notifications just start going crazy. <laughs> I had one girlfriend who FaceTimed me and was like, I just need you to stop what you're doing, please. <laughs> and go to YouTube, just, just four minutes of your life, just please watch it and call me back. I'm like, I already saw it, you know? Um, and so we're going back and forth and on first sight, I loved it because I love Beyonce and Beyonce is known, like remember her, her last, was it four, what was the name of the album that she dropped after Scandal oh, on a Thursday album, night? After Scandal, you've got everybody's attention, right? So the <laughs> album drops, we go crazy, like she's known for doing this. So the, 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 the song drops and we're loving it. I'm loving the visuals, I'm loving the sounds, um, I'm loving it because it's B. And then I remember the next, I started seeing the think pieces. Mm -hmm. So I think if the video dropped at three, the first think piece came out at like six. Mm -hmm. And between Saturday evening and Sunday, they just kept coming and they just kept coming. And then the Facebook posts and then the tweets and it was all this conversation. It's like, but I just want to dance to the song, y'all. So then when I start sitting and thinking with myself, I have to be honest as somebody who was born and raised in New Orleans mm -hmm. and was in Philadelphia when Hurricane Katrina hit, which means I watch my city underwater on TV. And very visceral responses to seeing water. So if I'm honest, I didn't watch Beyonce on top of that car. I looked away. If I'm honest, I've never seen the video to its end because I can't process watching her on top of a police car on top of the water itself is triggering. So what that ended up doing to me on a very personal level is also triggering other experiences from New Orleans. And Joan is absolutely right in the sense that Beyonce does push us all to a very personal space, right. you know what I mean? Um, but I was very transparent about that, that this isn't really about Beyonce as much as it is about me. So Beyonce has this line um, in the song where she says, um, she said, mama from Louisiana, daddy from Alabama, you mix that Creole with that Negro, you get a Texas Bama, and it's like record scratch, right? Because if you know anything about the black New Orleanian experience for years, there's been a rift between people who identify as Creole and people who are just regular Negroes. Like to the extent that you can't go to this neighborhood if you're darker than a brown paper bag. You're not getting into this high school. You're not going to be able to do X, Y, and Z in the city. Like it's very real. Um, and then it made me think about the fact that Beyonce once had a song called Creole which is problematic in its own right. And so it just made me think like, okay, I was so willing to be down with Beyonce and the party to this song that I kind of ignored myself, you know what I mean? Like I was, I was in the notifications, I was with my homegirls, we were all enjoying without paying attention to what I was actually feeling. Right. And for me, I don't think, I don't buy into the dichotomy of being critical. It's not hate or love necessarily. I think we can occupy spaces in between mm -hmm. that we can be critical of Beyonce and still love her. Absolutely. And I think for me, my criticism comes out of a space of like, you know we're best friends. Why would you say that? 
You know what I mean? Like, so let's think more critically about what it is that you're saying, B, because ultimately I love you. I'm not willing to throw you away. Right. But like if your audience is, a, and not even that, like when I, I, I connect the video to the Super Bowl performance, mm -hmm. I'm clear about what she wanted to do. Because at the end of the day, Beyonce didn't have to make that video. She didn't have to make that song. She didn't have to perform at the Super Bowl with Black Panther girls behind her. She didn't have to do that. She did that for us. So I acknowledge that. But at the same time, as my best friend, I want her to understand that she has to check herself sometimes on some things. That friendship is real. It's real. It's real. Yeah. Very real. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you, Yaba, and I'm, I'm so I, I got my training doing this work, having to work and exist in really uh, complicated, the complicated space of being a woman and being one of the first women actually to write about and be immersed in, in hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to do this work really without contradictions. Yeah. What has been amazing to me is the amount of leeway that people gave male rappers in terms of expressing their angst, mm. expressing their culture, mm. expressing uh, the impact of racism, their pain. Like, the, like we wrote reams and reams and reams about it. But Beyonce, Rihanna are expected to be our best friends. Yeah. They're expected to take care of our emotions. Yeah, no They're expected to be held to a particular kind of gendered behavior. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we don't have to question that. We do. Because we let the boys get away with all kinds of shit. No doubt. That we just expect them to behave and be better than that. Yeah. And I cannot think of really any reason other than because they're women. Mm -hmm. I take that. That's real. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> I, I love Beyonce. I'm not going to say I'm well versed in all her music, but um, I try to keep up with, you know, some things as far as, you know, her outside of music and things she does, um, you know, behind the scenes, whether, you know, it's something that's publicized heavily or not. So I think my first reaction when I saw the video, um, you know, I'm not from New Orleans or anything, so I don't, I don't know, um, you know, that, that story, but just for me, um, being from North Carolina and just a fan of the music and, you know, with everything that's going on, I was happy she made the statement. Um, you know, uh, what stuck out to me is, you know, one, she's always been, you know, <laughs> Um, a leader in the feminism movement, you know, and, and just sisterhood. So, you know, I, I noticed, you know, again, she had all girl background uh, mm -hmm. dancers and, you know, her band have a lot of women, in, uh, musicians in them. Um, a lot of, she employs a lot of women. So I noticed that, uh, you know, the, the drowning of the police car, you know, the little boy dancing in the street with uh, his hands up. You know, I think those were statements that stuck out to me. And, you know, they reminded me a lot of the things that Kendrick Lamar did in his video. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with me, you know, I, my first reaction was, wow, that's dope to see her make that statement. And, you know, to say, like, you know, to, to some people, like, you can be a fan of me, but, you know, this is still my culture. Mm -hmm. And these are still my people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just because I might be up here, it still affects me what goes on at ground level, and I'm gonna make a statement about it. But, um, you know, that was my first reaction to it anyway. But. So as we um, continue to think through our various reactions to the video, um, I wanna shift a little bit to the Super Bowl and to the live performance of Formation and to one of the many responses that came forward was from a group, a right-wing group, protesting her use of Black Panther costuming, right, as part of performance, um, to suggest that the NFL had supported, some, that, that Beyonce is racist or is, is doing something um, anti-American in the context of one of the most American um, uh, events. Uh, in our nation. So um, I'm wondering what do you all think about the reality of black women's bodies, right, being, um, being desired, right, but only to a certain extent, right? We're desired insofar as we can be consumed. But when our own desires, in this instance, Beyonce's desire to make a statement, 
even if that statement is nuanced in multiple ways. When our own desires are articulated, um, we, are, um, we, are, we become repulsive. So talk a little bit about the reaction of this group, um, their, um, their threat of uh, protesting in front of the NFL headquarters in New York City, and, um, and what that means about black women's desirability and black women's desires as, they're, um, as they are um, uh, negotiated in public spaces. Uh, I'm gonna try. <laughs> Try to see if I can get to the to the, to, to answering your question. Um, I talked about this with my students in terms of her Super Bowl performance because interestingly enough, in our politics of hip hop class, we had just had a conversation about Cointel Pro mm -hmm. um, and the ways in which it really kind of um, prevented the Black Panthers from organizing to their fullest extent in New York City. Um, and so they became familiar with Cointel Pro and Jager Hoover and, and what was going on. And so. When the Super Bowl performance comes and we see the imagery of the Black Panther, we have this conversation about why the right mm -hmm. is responding like that. And they're like, oh, well, because A, it's the Super Bowl. You know how many people watch the Super Bowl? You know how many people tune into halftime? And Beyonce, this nice black lady who we've loved for so long, giving us bootylicious and can you pay my automobiles? Like this we, nice lady. this nice right. lady, she's beautiful. Now becomes black. And right. you're right. So now you have the audacity mm -hmm. to get in front of this international audience with the motif of the Black Panthers and putting up your fist. Like, who do you think you are? So you've betrayed us, right? Um, and now you have to go. And it's so interesting to me that the automatic kind of visceral reaction to Panther symbolism is anti-police, mm -hmm. um, people throwing around the word racist. Um, much of what people know and don't know about the Panthers is filtered through a COINTELPRO lens. Right. So for me, it was a wonderful moment and the timing was great because I think, was it the next week that the Panther documentary came mm -hmm. on? Yeah. So I made my students watch that as well and like, the context is important because historically speaking, by the time COINTELPRO is initiated in 1956, somewhere in that area, we're only talking, we're talking about before the Civil Rights Act, Right? We're talking about only literally a few years that black folk were even beginning to integrate and beginning to even be considered in any true realm of our lived experience. So what you're saying is that we can be oppressed and terrorized for hundreds of years and then when we get quote unquote free and have access and recognize police brutality, recognize uh, disenfranchisement and poverty um, at these disproportionate levels and we try to then take care of ourselves, mm -hmm. you name us a hate group. Mm -hmm. And so for me it was important for my students particularly to watch the documentary to get the context, mm -hmm. to learn more about what the Panthers are and who the Panthers are. But it's just interesting to me that that visceral reaction right. coming out of space of ignorance. So again, for me, Beyonce didn't have to do any of this mm -hmm. for us, but she really, and I don't want to say it like this because I know it might not give credit to who the Panthers are and have been. I don't want to say Beyonce is the reason why people were paying attention, but in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. in this particular moment, Beyonce was the reason people were paying attention. Um, <laughs> do we actually have an image from the Super Bowl mm. of the girls, Mark? Yeah, I mean, if someone could, because I, I actually, I think that this is one of those moments where I'm really big on accurate reading, a critical reading of text. Mm. So I actually would like to know what the Panthers actually wore in comparison to what their dancers wore. I was like, I don't know, I missed it. I didn't see black women come out with rifles. Mm. I didn't see, bla I saw black women in fishnets in really, really, really cute um, leotards and body wear. And Afro wigs. And Afro wigs. Right. So and, and one, so and, and, one and, and the most political symbol was a raised fist. Yeah. Right. I watched Kendrick perform with chains around his neck, with his dancers, with flames up behind him. And don't get me wrong, I love the performance. Mm -hmm. Not the same response. Not at all. So what that is indicative to me is that there's a level of deliberate critical misreading of her body that's led by a particular kind of ownership. 
her body. Uh, because you consume Beyonce in a particular kind of way, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have ignored her blackness in order to give her a certain kind of sex appeal standard. Um, status that you now feel betrayed by mm -hmm. because you're not supposed to be that kind of black woman. Because honestly, they look great, but it wasn't that political of a statement. No, it wasn't. It really wasn't. Mm -hmm. It certainly was not anywhere near as political as, as like sinking, being on top of a police car mm -hmm. and watching it sink into the waters of Katrina, mm -hmm. which we also know is a statement about this kind of the government's benign neglect, mm -hmm. right? So I'm actually really curious what people saw when people, I mean, you know, yeah. she was out there just but let doing me, it with Bruno. Let me ask you this, though. I mean, and, and honestly, is it that different from what Janet wore? Janet wore when? At the Super Bowl. The one During Nipplegate. Oh, uh, Nipplegate. <laughs> well. No, but let me. <laughs> I mean, like, is that really that political a statement? They look cute. But let me ask you this, so to your point, right, so in thinking of, because immediately what happened after Kendrick's performance, right, then we start seeing people saying, well, I wonder what's going to happen if he's going to get the same kind of heat that Beyonce got. And I was waiting for the think pieces, right? And they didn't come with the same kind of fervor. But I think my question was in trying to think about that comparison that people are making. Do you think it has something to do with their positionality within the context of, like, mainstream white society? You know what I mean? Like, are white people going to, or the mainstream going to um, protest Kendrick? Like, do they are, isn't he already at an antagonistic relationship with them as a so-called, you know, gangster rapper, black man even? You know what I mean? Like, I'm wondering, and it's to your point about the access that people have had, right, to Beyonce in terms of what she owes them versus what Kendrick owes them, if anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that has a large part to do with it. It's like you say, uh, you know, Kendrick is the antagonist. He's always been black, viewed mm -hmm. as black. You know, Beyonce reached this supernova pop level, you know, and she crossed over where her music didn't even sound black anymore mm -hmm. to a certain degree. And, you know, uh, I think it's like that Saturday Night Live skit, you know. I don't know if you've seen Which it. One? There's a sk Saturday Night Live skit. Have y'all seen it? Yes. Some of y'all. So it's, um, they're making fun of, of white tears. It's like, oh, we see this, this, uh, this performance. This is like, not, not Beyonce. Oh, yeah, I did see that. You know, <laughs> she's, she's black? Like, <laughs> I didn't know she was black. Yeah, you know? so I, I think, you know, like your point, that has a lot to do with it as far as, you know, her versus Kendrick. Um, but, you know, I wonder, it's like you say, like, it's, she didn't say it was, you know, a Black Panther performance, but I wonder, you know, because we have this idea of the Black Panthers, whether it's a black turtleneck, all black with the hat on, you know, we just automatically assume, because you relate all of the, you know, that dress together. But also, there's also a picture of Michael Jackson, you know, mm -hmm. with the gold mm -hmm. bullets across his chest, mm -hmm. so it could have been a Michael Jackson tribute mm -hmm. as well, but... You know, and Beyonce just lets us think what we think. Right, right. right. <laughs> She's not coming to clarify <laughs> nothing. So if we can just roll with this, and Joan, I know I, I want you to, to respond to this, especially um, this idea of Beyonce kind of in this moment after having risen Rhapsody, as you say, <clears throat> to this level of mega superstardom, crossing over even perhaps in some of her sounds. Um, this moment of Beyonce becoming black, so that it's showing up on our timeline, right? That there is this correlation between her performance and the Black Panther Party, and how that ties into Yaba, what you, um, what your work is actually on around colorism and pigmentocracy, and how that shows up in the video. So, are there? Are, do you have any thoughts around? Um, around that, around Beyonce becoming black in a sense in this video in such a way that white folks are pushing back or resisting her to the point of threatening, you know, uh, protests, which never happened, of course, but the, the threat of, to the, to the reality of police departments, mm -hmm. right? Uh, having to vote, the police department here in Raleigh-Durham, having to vote on whether or not they would provide uh, security. services, security to her, at her concert, I mean, what, what's happening there and what's happening there, this, be, this move to become black in relationship to the colorism or the way in which race and, and pigment is playing out in her video. I'm thinking specifically of blue. Mm -hmm. 
and the little girls that are paired with her. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm gonna try to jump, jump in there because it, it's a lot. So, you know, one of the things that's really amazing about Beyonce is that she does very little in terms of um, self-narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, she basically kind of lets the work speak for her. Mm -hmm. um, she also does not do a lot of talking back to critique. Right. She goes in and she really speaks back to it during the work, mm -hmm. do, through the work. Um, and so I think some of this is that we're not used to hearing her own auto-narrative about herself. I don't know that I would say that Beyonce um, has become black. She's I think she's been always black. been black. She's this video black. happens to be blackity black. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it, it speaks to us in yeah. a particular kinds of way because we can read the, the code switching and certain mm -hmm. kind of like um, cultural signs that are sort of very, very deep mm -hmm. Southern in-house black mm -hmm. lingo. You know what I mean? Right. It's like very family right. in many ways. Um, but she's also speaking back to certain things that I just am amazed people don't want her to speak back to, like the positioning of her daughter in the video. Beyonce listened, and Jay, listened to months for people talking about how nappy her daughter's hair was, um, how unattractive her daughter was, uh, they better hope she don't look like Jay-Z, all the kind of critique that you give a brown-skinned black girl. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that people then feel a way about where she positions her own child in that video is really amazing to me. Even if what you feel would have been better is that do you think Blue should have been dancing behind two darker skinned black girls? It's her child. It's her child who she also, as a mother, is making a particular statement about what I, how I want to raise this little black girl to recognize her own magic. So in a way, it's not just white mainstream culture that exactly. feels that it has an ownership over Beyonce's body. It's all of us who expect her, who value our narrative about her more than her own, uh, to, more than her own auto narrative. Mm -hmm. Like we don't think she has the right to mm. speak for herself. Mm -hmm. for herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting because in the moment it's making me think and think and think some more because um, I wrote a piece about the video and I spoke specifically about these kinds of questions that I have. Right. No different than I would have looking at anybody else's video. So I was keenly aware that this is Blue Ivy. Now again, on first sight, mm -hmm. when I heard the line about, you know, I like my, what you say, I like my babies. Y'all yeah, yeah, yeah. know the line. So <laughs> I remember taking a screenshot and having a picture of Blue Ivy on my Facebook and my Instagram. I was like, that's right, Blue. You don't let them people talk about your hair. And our hair still ain't combed. Right? <laughs> so I was like, that was like a proud moment. Like, yes, B, you don't let these people talk about your baby. But again, because I have then been triggered about my own personal narrative mm -hmm. and what I'm seeing through that lens, mm -hmm. I'm also like, well, hold up. B, uh, uh, Blue is like a little princess in between these two darker skinned girls who are dressed like old women, mm -hmm. you know? And so that was at the time my critical lens. But as I'm listening to you talk, Joan, then I'm also thinking about that first moment I had of being proud of Beyonce for making that statement and now rethinking about the potential for her saying, I'm also making a statement by putting her in between these two dark skinned little girls, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, it points out to the fact that again, we, we read Beyonce and we read the images through our particular lenses and those lenses come on and off depending upon what we're dealing with or feeling in that moment. Right. Can I say something really quickly? I mean, I think part of what makes Beyonce so perplexing is the really crappy way that we do cultural criticism now. Sure. So you don't sit with an image for longer than five seconds before you feel like you have to write the same think piece. Mm -hmm. and, and particularly the formation video, there's a lot of complexity there. Mm -hmm. um, even as a professor, if somebody gave me a paper that they wrote overnight on the formation video, I pretty much know that that's going to be Personal. C level and below. Sure, sure, sure. Because you just have not taken enough time to work through the very contradictory images there to come up with a, a kind of like meaningful analysis. Mm -hmm. So it's not that your first reaction is wrong, it's that if you had a first reaction, and then a second and a third, the magic, the depth of the cultural criticism, the cultural criticism that actually moves us forward is you working through those opposing um, 
sort of reactions and seeing it what also what it says about the culture what it says about her but more importantly what it also says about you mm -hmm. and we just don't have forums anymore where people actually do critical analysis where you are literally like people started to send me beyonce pieces i would say maybe hour. six yeah maybe top six hours Not after like it came three, out three right three three hours there's nothing that in, that you've written in three hours that i really want to pay a whole lot of attention to that is your first draft that is your first draft. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So one of the lines, um, before we shift a little bit to talk about hip hop more broadly, one of the lines in the song is, ladies, let's get information, or something like that, mm -hmm. where, she, um, where she directly calls out to black women, right? And she does this within the context of all of the women dancing in formation. They're mm -hmm. all dancing and, you know, you know, doing doing their thing. And I want to I want to talk a little bit about black women dancing as pleasure <laughs> and as black girl joy and black girl magic. I mean, how do we interpret, you know, Beyonce, she's, you know, she's not 15. You know, she's a young woman, but she's not an adolescent woman. How do we interpret this grown woman dancing? you know, multiple levels, multiple moves, as black girl joy, as pleasure for us? I mean, I mean, <laughs> pleasure and dancing. I mean, I think those two things go hand in hand. I think it's cultural in a lot of ways for black women. Um, for me, I, my connection to hip hop as, is as a dancer. Right. So I was the polka dot pants and, and the yes. shiny shoes and the, bamboo earrings and the dancing hard sweating getting it in um she bought bamboo earrings today so that has not actually gone away <laughs> all that <laughs> <laughs> and and so for me like my my connection to hip-hop is mostly the music so dancing is also you know like when i think back in my memory of hip-hop i know choreographers names mm -hmm. more than i know mc's names you mm -hmm. know what i mean mm -hmm. so i think that's one of the things that i've always enjoyed about beyonce mm -hmm. is that beyonce always dances hard right like she is an athlete. Like when you think about the ways in which she trains her body, I've seen her in concert. I barely want to walk in these heels, let alone dance in them for hours. You know, so I, I, uh, she takes a lot of pride, you know, in that. But also I think, I'm assuming she gets some pleasure out of it as well. And the pleasure is, is, her, is her own pleasure in terms of what she's able to do with her body. But there's also a pleasure that comes in knowing that people are gaining pleasure in watching you dance. Right. And I think that's something that's very applicable to many of us. You put on a particular song and we gonna start dancing. Mm -hmm. You know, Joan and I had a moment in the bathroom uh -oh. before the panel started with Rihanna's work, right? And so there's certain songs that are gonna take you there. And I do think that, um, Dancing is an avenue for us to, to, to seek pleasure because I think it is about ownership of one's body, mm -hmm. what you're able to do with your body. There's a craft that goes into dancing as well. So I do see those things connected and I think Beyonce is a, is a beautiful representation of that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said and just to piggyback off of it, um, you know, it's, it goes back to Africa and just having that rhythm and coming from the drum, you know, it's, that's again part of our culture. But you know, dance, it shows individuality and freedom. And two, like when you dance together, it shows a unity. You mm -hmm. know, people love to do uh, line dances Always. <laughs> a lot. And routines. You know, right. That's, that's big at weddings, family reunions, yes. cookouts. Like it's something that, you know, everyone can do together. It's not too hard for the old folks and it's still young for the new kids. Um, so there's, you know, some unity in it, freedom in it, you know, it's, it's family togetherness. Uh, but, you know, like I said, it's just part of the culture too and the drum and, you know, that rhythm. You know, um, thank you for that question because one of the things I'm thinking in response to it is what is so different about this particular video in this moment? Because Beyonce's body of work is two things. It's always deeply engaged with the female audience. She's famous for like girl empowerment um, anthems. That is what she does. So this is not a typical of a long history of like, you know, we run the world, oh, yeah. you know? It's or even if it's like bills, bills, bills. She's right. still very much about girl power, right. so to speak. Um, and she also has a kind of very 
generous feminism. So it's never just about, I mean, sometimes it is with B. I'm cute. But even when she says, I woke up flawless, you know, then she says, we wake up flawless. Yeah, you know, she, push, she puts herself in a music video with two of the baddest black models on the face of the planet right now, Joan, Small, uh, Joan Smalls and uh, Imani Chanel. Mm -hmm. There is a whole narrative about beautiful black women not being able to share space. Mm -hmm. um, and she speaks to those narratives consistently in her work in a way that we seem to only be talking about like it, in terms of formation, like it happened yesterday. Her entire body, she's not an easy, she's, she's really a deceptively easy read. Yeah. There's a um, line in, in French from one of the songs that I don't remember on the last album. Uh, partition. Partition, where in French, the translation loosely, because I don't really speak French, but is, she talks about it's a lie that feminists don't like sex. Mm -hmm. And she, there's a whole, you know, she samples that from, I, I don't remember what, what movie it is, but the sample plays really softly. Mm -hmm. And she's talking about being feminist and, and claiming a right to your own sexuality and sensuality and those two things not being in conflict. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think she also does is that I don't think she clap, she's not on Twitter, um, <laughs> you know, clapping back in 140 characters, that's not her thing, but she, you look at her work, she is deeply engaged with the critique. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, she went from the criticism of Bow Down, the first version of that record, mm -hmm. which honestly was really not that good, mm -hmm. um, to about how anti feminist it was. Mm -hmm. As then she goes and she samples Chimamanda and Gosia right. Dice. Right to be the feminist voice of something that we saw that was like categorically a more thought out and generous feminism. So I think that people are, one, limited in their scope, but they also don't read her work as a body of work mm -hmm. to kind of see where the growth is. So is it fair to, um, is it fair to read Beyonce in relationship to the movement? Black Lives Matter. Is that, I mean, so one of the pushbacks that I saw from many of the think pieces, well, she's, you know, she's not, um, you know, on the front line. She's not leading the movement. She's not this or that. She's an entertainer. But is it fair to read uh, women in hip hop as having a role in freedom movements? Is it even a fair, you know, is it even a fair estimation that that could be possible or should be? I didn't read the think pieces. I mean, my response to that is that <laughs> this is a woman that cuts pretty big checks for Black Lives Matter. So oh, yeah. mm -hmm. that's a role in and of itself. Yeah. Um, I don't really know what people want from entertainers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're entertainers. It's really nice when they have a kind of thoughtfulness and a narrative around their own work that we can sign on for. It's also informative when they don't. Right. And you know, I, I'm, I'm, all I can do is be very aware of my role as critic and what, what does the privilege of having a critical lens and an audience allow me to say mm -hmm. about the cultural art forms that are being produced. Mm -hmm. But I'm very leery of expectations of um, artists that expect them to be something that is shaped very much by your own political lens that they're simply mm -hmm. not trained to, to be. Right. Black Lives Matter has really great leadership. I'm not really sure why they need Beyonce to be part of that. Like, those girls are doing just fine. But the thing about it is, is that they don't, but they still welcome her. And so to the, the first part of your question, I mm -hmm. think it's bigger than Beyonce. It's for us to have this conversation about, like, well, what does the front line look like? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because we're so quick to say, well, she's not down here, or she's not on, many of us are not on the line. Right. You know what I mean? And so for me, the front line is sometimes my computer. It might be my phone on Twitter. Right. It might be a picture I post on Instagram. It could be a phone conversation that I have with somebody. Like, we have to be critical about, like, what we're calling the front line, because I think when we get narrow in this idea of who's down and who's not, it ultimately hurts the movement. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know that Beyonce hurt the movement at all. It's a hashtag movement to begin with, right? So we're all a part of it insofar as we engage it. Mm -hmm. So like questions of whether or not she belongs there and what she should or should not be doing, I'm not sure that any of us are in a position to tell her, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, that mm -hmm. she's down or she's not down. Right. Again, she didn't have to do that at all. What's the, so what's the role, Rhapsody? What's the role of, you know, women in hip hop as you see it in relationship to justice? 
Um, or is there one? I, I think there's a role, uh, you know, a quote of a good friend of mine, Ninth Wonder is, uh, with, with what much is given, much is expected, you know? And when you reach a certain level where you have influence over millions of people, you know, you have to take that and understand like, everything I do and I say is gonna influence them, influence to a certain degree. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're living in an age where everybody has an opinion, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody is ever happy as far as an artist when you're in the spotlight and the forefront that much, you can never do right, mm -hmm. you know. Um, if Beyonce and Jay were to come out and publicly, I know at one time they're like, oh, I don't hear them say anything. But when they do say something, it's like, oh, you're just piggybacking and it's a trend now. Mm -hmm. But if you don't say something, it's where's your voice at? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a lot of times, like you say, where you know, they like to find other ways to give back, whether it's in donations or you know, they want to bail people out and not have media you know, all over it. You know, they have to do what's comfortable for them. Um, but at the same time, you do have to understand that you, do, that you are a leader you know, in a certain degree. So I, I honestly think, you know, it's up to the artist to define how far they want to go with it and what it means to them. But, you know, I think they should understand that, you know, when you're in the spotlight in the forefront, you do have a responsibility and you are a role model and you have a lot of young people looking to you for guidance at the same time. So, you know, it's, it's a hard gamble. You know. Yeah, everyone has an opinion. Joan, you mentioned very, you know, correctly that those opinions are gendered. So how do we as, in ways that are unfair of course to the artists and to us as black women, how do we as lovers of hip hop, um, as those who are Beyonce's best friend in our head, um, how do we resist those kinds of gendered opinions that really further subjugate black women? Um, so a lot of the work that I'm doing now around my dissertation really looks at um, black women's sexuality and labor. Mm -hmm. um, and although we are very, like in black feminism, we have a very strong narrative around, understanding around um, how black women's labor was coerced forcefully and illegally, legally and sexually, mm -hmm. right? We understand that. Um, I'm looking at the ways that uh, what we sometimes call respectability politics, I actually don't really use that term because I don't think it gets us very far. Right. Um, it sort of loosely describes a set of conservative mores or opinions. Mm -hmm. I, I'm much more um, invested in the term representation politics mm -hmm. because I think that that's what black women are expected to do. Is they're expected to represent the race in a particular way in which that their, their, their uh, cultural products, mm -hmm. um, particularly those that are sexual or erotic in nature, mm -hmm. are still supposed to hold up the status quo in a particular kind of way. Mm -hmm. So you're not supposed to show too much flesh. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to do things that disrupt the sort of um, representation of, of the race. Mm -hmm. But who is being represented, you know, mm -hmm. um, who gets lost in that representation is, is actually quite broad. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things that I, I, I try to do in the work is look at, okay, this critique, what are they really, what's the labor that Beyonce is expected to do? Mm -hmm. What's the labor that Rihanna is being expected to do here? Um, so when, you know, the critique for work, right, mm -hmm. is that she's speaking gibberish. Mm -hmm. Um, and the labor is, is that she is supposed to, even though she's a Caribbean woman, resist doing the work of making us recognize her Caribbean-ness in the context of blackness, right? So it's tropical house and it's gibberish, but it's not reggae and Jamaican dance hall, which it has always been. Always. Mm -hmm. so, any, so there's a labor that we attach, particularly to black women's bodies and their cultural products, that we tend not to attract, um, attach to anyone else. Right. So I'm, I'm always really trying to be hyper aware of it mm -hmm. and call it out in my, in my own work. I also just want to go back to something that you said later when we talk about basically the question is um, how political do we sort of expect our right. artists to be? Right. And so I'm wondering how broad is our interpretation or can we be more capacious or generous mm -hmm. in our understanding of the political and what is political work? So yeah. at a, in, a, in a society that consistently black, uh, maligns black women's images, 
that doesn't see black women as beautiful, that doesn't recognize us? Um, is there a kind of political power in watching another black woman be loved and represented on stage that makes you feel good in the morning? That makes you like, is there a political utility in being able to say to yourself, you know what? I may have like eaten way too much and the scale's not doing what I needed to do and you know, my hair's not right, but you know what? I'm flawless, because you know what? We woke up flawless. I think that she's deeply, in, deeply engaged in this conversation that we're having right now around black girl magic and black girl joy. And the reason that we need those hashtags is because there is so much black girl pain. And that is deeply political yeah. work. It may not be Black Lives Matter, right. but it is the, you know, the politics around the erotic, the politics around pleasure for right. black women is deeply important work and it's healing work. Right. And you have to be in a better place to be able to recognize that, to be able to wake up and say, Beyonce who represents A, B, and C, right? Mm -hmm. I can still see my reflection in her. And so when she tells me we are flawless, I see myself in that we. Mm -hmm. And so I think it comes back to that very personal place. Mm -hmm. Like there's stuff that we have to do to be able to even appreciate some of the work mm -hmm. that I think a lot of people are doing, mm -hmm. but because we want it to fit in a particular box and only look a particular way, we don't, we're not able to see that politicized movement in their work, simple as it is. And if I can say, um, the first time I heard Rhapsody's voice was on Complexion. Yes. yes. Right? Now, I told you the work that I do. So I'm listening to Complexion. I'm already in love with Kendrick for doing this song. And then I hear this sister's voice come on. And it's not a cute little, I'm pretty, come appreciate me. It's like, this is who we are. This is who we gonna be. This is who you should be. And don't let anybody tell you any different. So I want to just thank you for that. Because that was fly and that was necessary. And that was powerful. And that's Political, like you have a responsibility to some degree mm -hmm. when you have the mic and you talk to black women. And I think that you did your thing, so thank you for that. Thank you. You want to say anything about that work, Rhapsody? <laughs> Complexion? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know. People ask me all the time, like, why do, why do I do this? Like, what's my drive? And I, yeah. I tell this story at shows all the time. And, you know, I, I, just outside of me loving music, I grew up in a time where I had so many powerful black women to look up to, especially in hip hop, and they all were different. And I loved them all. I had Queen Latifah, I had MC Light, I had Missy Elliott. I loved Lil' Kim and Foxy Brown too. And right. they all were different, you right. know? And that was a beautiful thing. It's like, you know, whatever you relate to, just be yourself. Like at the end of the day, we're all women, we're all different, but we're all strong, powerful, and beautiful in our own right. So, you know, I, I wanna do that for my nieces, you know, and my little cousin, a lot of little girls that don't have that, that to look up to now because, you know, they give us one and Nicki Minaj, and I think she's beautiful, I think she's talented, and I think it's dope that she loves her body. But you know, we need balance and that's what's missing. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's the joy that I get out of it. Um, you know, I have a niece, she's six now, but when she was four, I used to take her to get Barbie dolls mm -hmm. and she would never want the black ones, <laughs> never. Like, they're ugly, I don't like it, I don't want it. And it made me think like, I don't want her to not love herself and look in the mirror and think of herself as not beautiful or not enough. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's, that's what I take as my purpose when I do music. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, it, for the people that I speak to, that I want to touch the most, which is black women, that's been the hardest to reach for me. Mm. Mm. Say more about that. Mm. It's, black women have been the hardest and the last group for me to reach. And for them to accept me for who I am, how I dress, mm. the type of music that I make, the subject matter that I talk about, mm -hmm. you know, um, I can remember, you know, uh, whether it was myself or ninth, getting messages of, you know, why you dress her like that? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you know, I thought that you didn't, you are tired of these images that we're portrayed in as always having to show our boobs and always having to show our butt and being objectified by men, but now you have a problem with the way I dress. So why are we not happy? Like, you know, what is it? You know, that would be one thing or, you know, um, I did, North Carolina Central Homecoming <clears throat> recently. And you know, I, I would read some of my Twitter feeds and you know, it'd be a lot of pushback from black women. Mm. You know, like, who is she? Oh, she ain't nobody. She 
she got no clicks, and it's just like, well, why can't you be happy that there's a black woman who raps being represented at the show? Why do I have to have this celebrity for me to be validated and important and loved by you? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's just some of the pushback. Um, you know, I, I love Essence and I love Ebony, but that's one of the hardest magazines for me to get in touch mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. Ebony, Ebony not, but Essence, but it's for black women. And mm. it's like, man, but I get, I get, you know, these emails or when I contact, you know, maybe these white liberal sites, it's not as much pushback. And that's the most disheartening thing for me as a black woman in music to have to do. So, but that's, that's the... Yeah. Joan, given your experience and your discussion about representation politics, what, what is behind that? What is behind um, this claim that um, black women are pushing back against Rhapsody? Black women are the hardest group to break into. Well, um, you know, I think that it's really, uh, and part of it is that it's just sort of easier, right, for us to think, when we think of black women, black community, it becomes more manageable when we think of it as a homogeneous group, right. but we're not, right. right? And so we come from a lot of different places. We have different stories. A lot of those stories are informed by particular kinds of unhealed trauma and unhealed pain. Right. Um, that some of us are deeply sexist and misogynist. That's not just the province of men. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, patriarchy functions that way. It shapes society, and there are men and women um, in society. And so I think that when we, when we see sentiments that are kind of um, deeply uh, anti-feminist or deeply anti-women in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we then have to kind of go back to the fact that we're shaped by many of the same things that, you know, we say that we don't want anymore. Um, and so um, I think that those people who, who text those things to you are struggling with their own kind of perceptions of desire. Mm -hmm. This is what I've been trained to think is desirable. Mm -hmm. This is actually what I get positively rewarded for mm -hmm. or wearing. So if you're gonna do something different and get positively rewarded, what, what does that mean about me? Right. So, you know, we are intricately interwoven and connected to each other, but there's a really strong politics of just difference that we're constantly having to kind of navigate, you know? So we're not, we're not in the same place. So there are people, right, for, if I had come in today with the way I usually wear my hair, which is very short, low Caesar, they make a whole different set of assumptions about me than if, I have, than if I'm doing this, right? So um, the dude that was smiling at me at, at, at Beauty World does not expect <laughs> this woman to be behind the mic. No doubt. You know? Um, and so I'm exactly the same. Well, maybe just a little. <laughs> but I'm pretty much the same person. But there's a whole other set of assumptions about what happens when I dress a certain way or I, I wear my hair a certain way. Um, and what I, what I argue for all the time is that we're complicated and we're nuanced. And, and within my own body, there are a ton of contradictions. Yeah. Um, and my feminism pretty much is rooted in a, in a kind of contradictory um, space. Yeah. Yeah. So It's also interesting to think about that pushback, as you say, for women, black women, sisters probably wanting, like you say, you to reflect them, right? And, and be affirmed for that. Um, but it's making me think of just even when I think of different MCs, female MCs, and the changes that they've gone through with their aesthetics, you know? So when I think of Lil' Kim, Junior Mafia Lil' Kim, all the way to Lil' Kim now, and Lil' Kim in the middle, I remember how much, I mean, hardcore was revolutionary. It's 20 years this year. Wow. So hardcore comes out, and I remember on the ground the conversations that were swelling because of, you know, what she was saying, but then I'm thinking, on the one hand, there are people who are looking at her and assuming that Biggie made her dress like that, that the industry made her dress like that to be um, successful without us considering the possibility that maybe that brought her her own pleasure. You know what I mean? Like, this conversation that we have about objectification is usually just about men and the male gaze without us also considering the female gaze, without also considering the self mm -hmm. 
gaze. And I think there's power in claiming one's pleasure and we don't give it to black women, if that makes sense. We don't believe that it's inherent to them to say, this is who I am and right. I wanna do it like this or I wanna wear this or whatever. We assume that it's all about the attention of men without also considering, I think a lot of, a lot of women, when we get dressed, Right, we might be considering how men are gonna look like us, but we're also aware that there are a lot of women who are looking at us, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And so like we have to engage all of those gazes, those things are important to our, our reflection of ourselves. Right. Um, we, I think it's about time for us to move out into questions from the audience. But one more question before we do, if that's okay, Mark. Um, Joan, you brought up, um, this idea of woundedness, right, that shows itself through uh, the politics of representation and how we are responsive to them or not. You've also, Yaba, brought up the idea of, um, of gays and how gays is disrupted based on, based on how we um, understand gender to be working out itself out in gays. This is all coming off of um, riffing, kind of off of Rep Rhapsody's own testimony about her experience about women. So I wanna kind of circle back to this idea of woundedness and black women and the image that in the formation video of the sacred along with the secular that you lifted up, the image of the church and of bodies in ecstasy, um, the way I'm reading the sacred and the secular in, in the video this idea of bodies kind of in ecstasy, dancing in ecstasy in black churches while bodies are drowning in the streets, mm -hmm. where, where children, black children, are being um, asphyxiated, being shot by the police. Um, I'm wondering, given the woundedness of black women, um, given the woundedness of the black community in some respects that Beyonce is pointing towards where does healing come from? Is our healing in the music? Because it seems as if it can't possibly be in the, ch the churches, the place where we think it ought to be. It's interesting that you, you read it that way because I read it completely different. So mm -hmm. I think that it, it's about our entry point and maybe our own spirituality. So when I, I see those images in the video, I'm connecting Beyonce to New Orleans, to Southeast Louisiana, to voodoo and to hoodoo, mm -hmm. and she looks like a magic woman to me. Mm -hmm. And that's more about a spell that she has cast mm -hmm. in terms of being able to drown that car mm -hmm. and to command that presence in the video. So mm -hmm. I actually don't. There are images of the church, though, in the video. I know. So how are you reading that? It's the background. <laughs> it's okay. Like, okay. I don't connect, and that's There's again, no. that's mm -hmm. just my read. It's not. I don't right. connect her, and I think it is deeply about connecting it to New Orleans. There's a lot of Catholicism in New Orleans, mm -hmm. but throughout the diaspora, we know that people have I mean, masked traditional religion, traditional mm -hmm. religion with right. Christianity. So mm -hmm. I don't automatically see Christianity when I see Christian motifs. Gotcha. Yeah. So is our healing in the music then? Ah. Uh, I think the healing can be, I think the, the music can facilitate some healing, but I think we got to go to some other spaces for healing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there are multiple, you know, mm -hmm. you, you can't heal if, uh, you, you, you literally cannot heal if you have to, to worry about police stopping your black body and picking you up for any reason that they want yeah. and murdering you in custody or murdering you in the street. Yeah. So that's one level, you know what I mean? Like, like music can't possibly do all of it. Um, churches can't do all of it, but I believe churches can do some of it, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, and that we should all be probably trying to, to play our part. Are there questions from the audience? No? No questions? Yes, <laughs> over here in the corner. Yes.
that's going to be a, I didn't get all the question. Can you ask, can you, can you formulate the question in one sentence? One, just one. Okay, go ahead. What'd she say? No, we can, we can hear. So, um, black women, and w can you talk about the ways in which, if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, the ways in which black women do not get the same kind of, um, the same kind of pushback. Is that, is that fair? The same kind of pushback, or they get more pushback from, as black women than say Kendrick or um, you know some of our other brothers in the industry, right? That black women are getting this pushback. And in your own experience, can you say more about how you've received that? So why, why we tend to get more pushback? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has a lot, you know, to do with what you both were talking about. Um, you know, just kind of our own pain um, and I don't, you know, hopelessness too at the same time where maybe you, you fed this image so long and you, you're so used to this, this same narrative where it's something different. It's like you say, uh, they don't know maybe how to relate to it. Um, I'm not really, I'm not sure. Like I'm still trying to figure it out, honestly. Uh, you know, just, just through my experiences. Um, why it, it seems we get so much pushback, uh, but I don't. I don't know. I'm not. Okay. Can I'm I, not sure. Can I yeah. just say something? I mean, this this is not directly. Um, it's it, it's inspired by your 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 question or your comments. Um, so part of part of the work I do in feminism is to actually um, try to. Um, demystify some of the expectations of feminism that I think are, and ask, are they really realistic? Right, right. So, the, so is it feminist to think that all women are going to be sisters? Is it feminist to think that women are not competitive with each other? Is it feminist to think that just because two women show up and they both have, are gendered and they perform female gender performances that they have to be friends? And I think, and, and men don't do this, and we don't seem to have a problem with that. But we seem to, like, feminism seems to ascribe a certain kind of kumbayaness mm -hmm. to women's relationships that I'm not always sure is um, practical or even fair because yeah. it doesn't allow us to be human. Right. Um, human beings are complicated, human beings don't all like each other. Um, and so my point is less that we all like each other, but how do we figure out, even in the times that we don't particularly like with each other, like each other, how do we work around these issues that are huge human rights issues for women? Not just here, but for globally. Like I don't need us to all be the same. I don't need us to all agree. I do need us to figure out a way to how to figure out how to get some shit done. Another, yes. And there is a mic oh. right there. If you can, yes. And if we can kind of streamline the question, so make it. Great. So I know that you're last point. Why is whether or not all women are friends an important part of the discussion of feminism? Why is it? Yeah, why is it? I don't, I don't, I don't, I would argue that it's not, I would argue that it's not important or necessary, but um, we have long narratives around sisterhood. So the idea of feminism, particularly black feminism, um, but feminism writ large, is about this idea of sisterhood, about bonding together, um, 
to combat oppressive forces and in, in uh, specifically patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And in that, it sort of puts feminism, feminists on a kind of moral pedestal that doesn't allow for the fact that there's difference and people might not necessarily like each other or be competitive with each other or want the same things and not really like, you know, I mean, in a all way while that- being feminist, uh, uh, all while still maintaining their feminism. Right, all, right. All while also being feminist. So I think it's a part of um, the kind of anthem of feminism that doesn't really look at, at, at realistically as women as complicated human beings. You want me to, end? okay, so, um, yeah, sure. because they're not always micro, unfortunately. So, um, so one of the ways that this plays out will be discussions, black feminists versus white feminists. White feminists will describe a problem, what white feminism, what white feminists will see as a problem versus what they will rally behind um, as, as a feminist problem. And part of the problem there is that it's not a microaggression if you're failing to see intersectionality. So if you are not really dedicated to the ways that race and class and gender make oppression different for different groups of people, it's really hard to work, or work together around those issues because you can't recognize that what may not be a problem for you is a serious life-threatening problem for someone who looks differently than you. And vice, and vice versa, what you might want me to be invested in, I just don't have time to be emotionally invested in right. that day right. because you know I'm worried about being the next Sandra Bland. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for your question. Yes. Yes, please. Y'all should line up at the mic. Right, if you have a question, you should form a line at the mic. Let's be out. <laughs> we only have to take <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about?
take your first question, if you'd okay. like. That's okay. <laughs> we can take, take that first question. Anybody want, how about you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. What was that question? I, th I mean, I think I, I hear your question in a lot of ways, and people say, when are we going to do this? And I think we are doing it. We're just looking for this massive revolution to happen all of a sudden overnight where everybody will get it, and we're ignoring all of the ways in our everyday lives, which we a lot of people are getting it. You know what I mean? So if you're not experiencing this, and I tell my students this all the time, if you're not having that experience, then maybe you need some different circles. Maybe you should gravitate toward people who are affirming or who do get it and who are... I don't know that, um, that's a whole other conversation. I don't know that unity is a practical goal because if we wait on unity, we'll keep on waiting. So like, what can we do while that's gonna happen? You know what I mean? So like, I don't know that I project to this place of when are we gonna unite more so than like, when are we going to you know, think critically about what it is that we're doing and how we're relating. So it's happening, you know? And if you're not having that experience, then you find the people who are doing it and roll with them. We have time for one more question. Yes. If, go ahead, speak right into it. Uh, my name is Pat, and my question is for you, um, for general. But what advice would you give yourself um, for negative behavior or what would you tell yourself when you're younger? Let me see. What would you tell yourself? We're still young, honey. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. <laughs> I wish probably for me, I don't know if it was tell myself, but just to, the things that I think about now, I wish I didn't care so much about what people thought, you know, at a certain age. I wish I knew how to tap into myself and move forward as opposed to trying to make a whole bunch of people happy. Um, I think it took me becoming an adult to figure out like what makes me happy, as opposed to just kind of going with the flow and doing the things that other people said would make me happy. Um, so that's the only thing I can think of in the moment, yeah. Yeah, mine was gonna be something similar to that. Um, you know, just be yourself and love yourself and like, like walk in your own life, yeah. you know, continue to do that. Um, I would, Affirm, this is, you know, I, I just turned 50 um, in May. So this is a great question because I actually have been wrestling with this a lot. And I think one of the things that I would tell myself is, I would tell my younger self, you don't really wait for permission and that's a good thing. Because mm -hmm. no one is going to grant you permission. You, take it. you have to take it. And if you're being really visionary about anything, if you are the first person producing something, there is no blueprint that is going to be handed to you. Visionaries don't get blueprints. Mm -hmm. And so that discomfort that you're feeling about the fact that no one else has done it before, that's the feeling that you should go hard and go after. Nice. Won't you join me in thanking these wonderful women,